All right, so I, I, mean, I, guess I, I guess it's that time. We should get started. It's kind of an informal session, not a moderator, so I'm the first speaker, Peter Levitt. I'll just give, kick us off. Um, I should quickly mention that when I conducted this research and uh, submitted to the conference, I was at Dickinson College in the fall. I started at Indiana State, um, so just making you aware of that. Um, that out of the way, I am very excited to share with you some research <clears throat> um, uh, and hopefully some useful insights that I've been doing looking at the kinds of anti-racism resources that uh, non-experts tend to recommend when we call on them to make these kinds of recommendations. I am going to start with the, um, the premise that anti-racist education is important, that it's valuable, and we have some empirical evidence to support that it's useful in a lot of ways. Um, but knowing that, it's also clear that anti-racist education is difficult, and this is the case for a variety of reasons. The subject matter is sensitive and complex. Resistance and backlash are common. Um, there are... Um, so, pause, PowerPoint crash. <laughs> What do non-experts recommend? 
And then building on that, to what extent are those recommendations likely to be acted on, result in some sort of behavioral, cognitive attitude change, either for themselves or others? Uh, there are a lot of possible ways I could evaluate the answers to those research questions. Um, I've taken a fairly broad approach here, and I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts about the approach that I've decided to take. But because there are a lot of different ways to do it, um, because of the unpredictability and variability inherent in this kind of work, uh, I decided to draw really broadly from some social psychology fundamentals. So rather than focusing on specific theories, just kind of thinking about what I know about how um, attitudes and behavior and that kind of stuff works. And so I pose a few questions when considering the recommendations uh, my, that, these, that the sample shared. Is it easy to do? Um, is there a specific plan, specific opportunities? To, is, is it likely that people will feel competent and able to engage in these behaviors? Is it accessible? Are there practical obstacles um, potentially impeding the strategies that are recommended, like cost or time? Is it potentially threatening? Is it likely to evoke negative emotions? Is it likely to evoke uh, worldly defense, the need for self-esteem bolstering, anything like that? And is it persuasive? So to the extent that the message is delivered, is it coming from a source that's likely to be seen as credible and likable to the audience? Is it a strong argument that takes into account audience characteristics and values and traits that are likely to influence one's receptiveness to, to the information? And these questions, I think, are particularly important when considering that uh, non-experts might be more likely to target people who are more resistant and let, have less access to this kind of education. So to do this, I conducted an online survey of Dickinson College psychology students. Dickinson College is a small liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania. And the focus of the study were three questions, open-ended questions, asking students to provide general recommendations for anti-racist resources, specific resources, and Google search terms that one could use to pursue this kind of education on Google's own. To give you a quick sense of who my sample is, because I think this matters, uh, and I'll talk about it more later, um, pretty representative of Dickinson College students as a whole, to be frank, and just to highlight a few things, they claim to be pretty knowledgeable, uh, pretty no motivated to learn about racism, low and modern racism, pretty high in need for cognition, they're pretty well educated, um, and predisposed to want to learn about and share about our racism related things. So, to get right into the prompts, so this is the first one, the premise that I set out is the White people could do more to educate themselves about racism. What would we recommend um, white people do to become better educated about racism? So some research assistants and I went through these responses and identified some themes and patterns. I'm gonna highlight a few of those here and talk about some of the implications of them. So some of the most common things that were mentioned were the need for intergroup contact and educational opportunities. So people were aware that intergroup contact, exposure to diversity, listening to other people's experiences is really important. They also knew that education was really important. They recommended that people take classes. Interestingly, they also recommended to, to a prompt asking them about how to educate oneself, but they often said, you should educate yourself. Um, and so these are good suggestions, but I also think when applying these kind of general criteria to them, uh, social psychology knowledge, that these are easier said than done, that access is often limited, uh, not everybody, especially harder to reach populations, not everybody has access to diverse spaces, to formal educational opportunities. Um, these kinds of experiences are interpersonally threatening, even just as people interacting with strangers in new spaces for the first time. And while I think there's good evidence, uh, I know there's good evidence that intergroup contact and education are good for addressing racism, that merely telling somebody that they should engage in intergroup contact and take classes is not a particularly persuasive argument. Um, the second things, um, themes that, I, that really showed up a lot was this call to be open-minded and be motivated um, to engage in this kind of work. Which, again, as, as somebody, I mean, as a college professor, I love thinking about this stuff. This is really important to me. But I also know that, again, it's much easier said than done to just be open-minded, what does that mean? Uh, be motivated, want to learn. Um, it seems, it's much easier said than done. It's, again, not universally accessible. There's a lot of potential for differences in values and background knowledge and so on to lead to differences in what it means to be open-minded, what it means to be motivated, and the kind of threat one's likely to experience when they do this. And again, just telling somebody 
to be open-minded is not a particularly persuasive argument. Uh, next prompt. <coughs> uh, ask them about some good specific resources for educating oneself about racism. So the idea was to get specific resources here. I'm going to highlight a, a couple different ways of looking about this. The most commonly mentioned um, resources and then some specific categories of resources. And the thing I want to highlight here, so there's 160 suggestions and these are the ones that came up the most often. So one thing I want to highlight here is that 10 of the 15 most commonly recommended things were general suggestions. So psychologically speaking, suggestions that aren't particularly likely to lead to specific behaviors um, and that might seem overwhelming and that you might not know where to go when you start engaging in this process. Uh, when I break it down into categories, so books, movies, news, internet, personal communication, and other, other categories contain things like podcasts and music, when you break it down into this, and then also whether the suggestions were general or specific, gives you a different picture of what people are suggesting. Lots of specific books and movies suggested, um, news organizations, uh, things like that. And what I noticed when looking at these resources is that there's often practical limitations to people's access to this stuff. There's often cost involved, whether it's just like a, um, the, the news organizations with a kind of paid access, the cost of internet, the cost of books, the cost of movies. Certainly time is a major resource involved in a lot of this stuff. So again, it's not uh, easy to suggest, but not necessarily easy to follow through and engage in this stuff. Not universally accessible. Uh, there's, I, I noticed a strong potential for, kind of for threat because of differences in sources, lots of value differences. And there's just a huge variability in the kinds of resources people were suggesting. Sometimes the educational and persuasive value of the suggestions wasn't immediately apparent to me. It seemed more like it was things that had impacted that person, but weren't necessarily going to be good um, educational resources. The next prompt, um, imagine you were to do a Google search, what specific search terms would you use? Uh, they gave a lot of different suggestions. Uh, my research assistants and I tried to synthesize their suggestions into kind of into five search terms that would produce a manageable number of search results and seemed to capture the themes that showed up. So these are the ones that we uh, found. We conducted these searches. It came back with 52 results. We just looked at the first page of results for each search term and we went through these search terms, uh, these results, and tried to identify some themes and patterns. So some things I noticed here was that often there were long lists of resources and other websites, so the landing page you went to directed you to a whole bunch of other resources. Uh, lots of books and reading lists of books, uh, including a lot of academic books, books written by academics and professors, some of which would have been difficult, were expensive or difficult to access. Uh, wikis, dictionary, and encyclopedia entries came up a lot. Uh, wikis were incredibly long, typically. Uh, a lot of left-leaning organizations uh, are where you find this kind of research. Not inherently a bad thing, but it does suggest some limitation on the kind of audience that's likely to be appealing to. Um, and I did a quick reading analysis, uh, readability analysis on all of the, the URLs that took you to a page of text rather than a page of other links. And what these numbers suggest is that the average reading level for the resources that you come across is a college level, a uh, college reading level. Um, so there's some difficulty in comprehension potentially involved, just reading comprehension, let alone the background knowledge required to understand things and put things into context. So um, my impression of the, the results that you get when doing a Google search for these kinds of things is that they're the kinds of things that would be most appealing, educational, and persuasive to people, to an audience who is well-educated, left-leaning, highly motivated, and has time to spare to read and explore a wide variety of resources on anti-racism. So putting all this together, summarizing it, my non-expert sample, uh, who are highly motivated, very well-intentioned, they made a lot of recommendations that unsurprisingly would be most appealing to people like them. Um, not inherently a bad thing, but it does suggest a limited audience to what they're, what they're suggesting. Uh, they often treat difficult psychological tasks as if they're relatively easy. They don't seem to appreciate um, what it takes to be open-minded, to expose oneself to discomfort and diversity and that kind of stuff. Often non-specific, uh, lots of potential practical obstacles to access and comprehension of the materials, and they often come from potentially backlash-inducing sources. So 
one way to, to summarize this stuff is that this, the recommendations that my sample gave may end up giving the impression that learning about racism is only for certain people, the more liberal, well-educated, um, kind of affluent folks, uh, might make learning about racism seem overwhelming or uninteresting, if, especially if there's a gap in values or knowledge about the stuff in the first place. And it may, in fact, have the unintended effect of rather than easing the burden on uh, overburdened educators, it may shift that attention back. So when people suggest intergroup contact and education, formal education, it is shifting, the, shifting it back to those experts. Um, and when people encounter overwhelming or difficult to comprehend information, it may need, they may need to turn back to experts anyways. So some things that this made me think about, and I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts about this as well, is as educators, I think we can be models to educate. Uh, presumably these students in my sample learned somewhere about what's important about anti-racism, what they should share with others, and that kind of stuff. And I think that we as educators have lots of opportunities to model what this looks like. And specifically, I think things like not writing off the hard to reach, the less knowledgeable and less motivated. Certainly there are practical considerations to, to take into account here, but uh, I think we want to avoid thinking that they're not worth attention. Uh, highlight the importance of scaffolding learning. So this is just classroom stuff. Like We know that not everybody has the same starting point, and we need to be attentive to where that starting point is for different people. Uh, we can create and bring awareness to scaffolded, audience-tailored resources for anti-racism, um, whatever that is. And a, more, a general one, Google it might not be a great suggestion. It might be a good way to kind of deflect and understandably, if you're frustrated or overwhelmed, it's an understandable response, but it's not a particularly effective educational response. And as far as future research on this topic, I'd be really interested in looking at how sample characteristics influence the kinds of recommendations made. My sample was mostly white. I suspect that had uh, an influence, a big influence on the kinds of recommendations that were made. I'd be interested in looking at if there are differences in what people recommend for others versus what they would be willing to do themselves to educate themselves more about racism. And my reach goal is uh, naturalistic research in informal settings on this topic. So when this kind of research opportunities arise outside of formal, well-controlled settings, what are going to be the most effective strategies? What are some simple um, things that we can recommend that people do when you encounter somebody at a bar or in the cafeteria or whatever that, you, that might help nudge people in the direction of uh, better anti-racism? And with that, thank you very much um, for your time. <laughs> I think we have time for a question while the next person sets up, and then we'll save more questions for the end of the session. Thank you for your talk. My name is Josie, by the way. Um, so I'm just curious. So these are their thoughts on what they, you know, think. Like, what are the best like methods or ways to stimulate anti-racism, you know, awareness or something like that. So are you interested in like what sets them off from moving about thinking about race and racism to actually anti-racism action? So this is their thoughts about how to learn about it. What about what they do about it? So I'm curious to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely interested in both. I was trying my best to like really narrow things down for the purposes of the talk, but absolutely interested in that. So I think about it in terms of uh, those who care about anti-racism, I think would agree that we want people to change uh, both attitudes and cognitions, we want them to change behaviors, we want them to be able to have an influence on other people. And so I think any of those avenues would be good. And I think a lot of times we rely on non-experts to, to intervene in those, in those directions. So yeah, I would absolutely be interested in all, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. So have a look. Thanks. All right, everyone. So my name is Mandana Gilbindra. Um, I recently graduated from NC State University. Um, my presentation today, entitled Moving Beyond Hashtag Activism, Teaching Racial Literacy Through Social Media, um, was actually uh, part of a larger, <laughs> it's gonna go on without me, uh, qualitative uh, study which was a phenomenological case study that I conducted for my dissertation. And the larger study explored how social justice oriented emerging adults um, engage with racial issues online and how this engagement is related to their moral identity. So I used two theoretical frameworks for that. The first was a social cognitive model of moral identity, uh, and the second was critical race theory. So for this presentation, I'm just gonna be focusing on the critical race theory um, element of 
So the quotation from my interview with Nathan that's featured on this slide, a lengthy one, <laughs> um, demonstrates how those who lack a systemic understanding of how race operates, particularly those who espouse political <coughs> beliefs, uh, tend to respond to instances of racial inequality. So Nathan stated, um, I often see people try to use the idea of being colorblind as an excuse to not care about racial inequality. So someone will complain about how they were affected by poverty and unemployment because of their race or uh, discrimination. And then someone who's white will say, oh, well, where I live, it's really hard to get a job, as if because they're white and they solve that problem, that it somehow means that there's no such thing as inequality. So I guess people will, kind of like the whole hashtag all lives matter thing, where someone will complain about some injustice that's happening and someone will say, well, you know, of course you should have rights, but we should all have rights. And they're completely missing the point that they already have rights, that people are complaining because there's inequality. So it's sort of like saying, well, if we just ignore the problem, it'll go away on its own, which is kind of the opposite of how that works. The next point I want to talk about is uh, interest convergence. So that's the idea that those in the majority only tolerate advances for racial justice when it is in their interest to do so. Um, so, Isabella and Naomi both reference interest convergence, or lack thereof, interest divergence in the media. Uh, Isabella talked about how she relied on social media to make her aware of race-related issues in particular. Um, in response to whether she could become as aware from watching the news on television or reading newspapers, she stated, I feel like it wouldn't be as much because traditional media doesn't cover everything that's really out there. And if something is really messed up, they might not want to be involved, so they won't talk about it. In other words, when the mainstream media does not stand to gain anything from reporting on race-related uh, incidents, um, these incidents will not appear on television or in the newspapers. However, they do frequently appear on social media, as you all know, uh, with the recent spate of racially charged news shootings that appeared on Facebook Live. Uh, Naomi took a different angle, speaking about cultural appropriation in the media, as an example of interest convergence, in terms of black artists bringing in money for record labels and white teenagers and emerging adults listening to hip hop in order to seem cool. Uh, Sophia offered a critique of interest convergence in her response to social media post number three, which is up there. Um, she said, all lives matter until immigrants are at your door seeking sanctuary, uh, pointing out the hypocrisy of all lives matter supporters. And his, his response to the same social media post, Anthony uh, actually leveraged interest convergence to garner support from allies in the fight for racial justice, stating, I completely agree. Can you help me fight for the black lives? The next slide talks about a uh, critique of liberalism. So according to Del Delgado and Stefan Schiff, um, the cautious incremental quality of liberalism is a point of contention for CRT scholars who believe the systemic nature of racism requires drastic changes. Um, otherwise, the system merely swallows up these small improvements and everything goes back to the way it was. Uh, so participants in my study uh, touched on various aspects of liberalism and how it informs racial issues in the country, some agreeing with it and some critiquing it. Um, and in her interview, Laura referenced racial issues as something she feels very strongly about, um, stating, I feel like not supporting the equality of humans is just unethical and doesn't make any sense. So it's exhausting to deal with someone who doesn't agree with that. So that's kind of one reason why they don't engage. Um, interestingly, while Laura acknowledged that she does post about social justice issues online, she admitted she's afraid to comment about racial issues in particular because she doesn't feel well informed about them and does not want to be seen as insensitive. Um, as a white female, she seems to have internalized colorblindness as a strategy for not engaging in conversations about race, at least in open, highly public forums. And this excerpt also indicates how she's using her belief in abstract liberalism to, to kind of justify her lack of engagement. Um, according to Naomi, liberal ideologies that tout equality and universality while still allowing people to pick and choose which issues are their issues to either support or tackle or disingenuous. I will say these, this group of emerging adults is very knowledgeable about these times. All right, and then I want to talk a little bit about dominant narratives of empathic fallacy. Um, empathic fallacy in particular um, has been defined uh, as the mistaken belief that sweeping social reform can be accomplished through speech and incremental victories within the system, or the belief that one can change a narrative by merely offering another better one, uh, that the readers or listeners' empathy will quickly uh, and reliably take over. Um, in order to be truly effective, counter narratives like any social justice initiative or reform effort must actually be artfully constructed in order to jar the comfortable dominant complacency in ways that include the dominant group and prompt them to voluntarily enter the conversation, recognize and evaluate their complicity in the system, or act on behalf. 
Um, in his interview, Nathan's well-intentioned comments uh, reveal how empathic fallacy operates in a white-dominated society. Um, so I'm gonna read part of this quotation. He said, uh, I think there's kind of this sort of secondary thing that goes on where, like, if you see someone saying something hateful or maybe using racist logic and you confront them publicly, that person might not change their mind. But other people who might have read their post and thought, oh, that makes sense, oh, I guess racial inequality isn't that much of a problem, and then they see a comment explaining why the post was wrong, and they're like, oh, actually, this post is wrong. Um, I shouldn't listen to this. So I don't, again, it's kind of just like an idea. Like, I kind of believe that's how it works, but I don't know if it's actually effective or not. But I still, I feel like maybe it's, uh, if there's some chance that it's helpful, why not? So a little bit more on this particular uh, topic. Um, Nizana's response to social media post number seven, which is up here in the slide, I know it's hard to read it. Um, she said, I don't think anyone using hashtag all lives matter is trying to purposefully um, suppress the movement, but rather they don't have a proper understanding of um, Black Lives Matter. Illustrates how even outgroup members can be impacted by the stock narrative about race relations in the US. And contrary to Rosanna's comment about um, hashtag all lives matter supporters not actively uh, attempting to suppress the Black Lives Matter movement, some participants in the study indicated that that's actually the primary purpose of the all lives matter. Understanding the cultural and symbolic value of 
employing perspective taking skills, interpreting racial codes and racialized practices, uh, determining if statements are promoting deficit views, um, critiquing the production and politics of media, uh, so for example, issues of access to means and knowledge, and who feels entitled to publicize their thoughts, who's viewing and commenting. Um, and being able to communicate effectively about race, so that's having a racial vocabulary. And then lastly, acknowledging racism as a contemporary problem, and either resisting it or personally, uh, personally or encouraging resistance. All right, so participants in the study um, actually had, you know, as you would imagine, varying degrees of racial literacy. Um, so I put up a couple of examples here, and I'll skip ahead in the interest of time. Um, but basically, um, given the current lack of conversations about race in their courses and the range of liter racial literacy in their responses, it became apparent to them that it would be beneficial for all students if components of racial literacy uh, were incorporated into the curriculum. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This was also important, um, but I won't go into detail about it. Students' experience with race-related incidents on campus or on social media actually affected their interactions with other students on campus, which I thought was, was pretty uh, revealing and uh, a little unsettling. There's a quotation up there. Well, let's skip to the discussion. So data analysis um, revealed that participants, again, had a wide range of perspectives on colorblindness as well. Um, all participants conveyed the importance of college students learning about colorblindness and its impact on both white students and students of color. And then some suggestions that were made by participants about how educators could implement a racial literacy curriculum um, that could potentially incorporate social media included such things like embedding racial issues and racial literacy skills into units that are already going to be covered selecting examples of social media posts that are illustrative, so not just random posts, uh, and presenting them alongside a meaningful analysis, um, asking students to respond to critical questions in relation to the so chosen social media posts. Um, so asking them why is this okay or why do we engage in these behaviors, and then a couple other things that are listed up there. And then lastly, in terms of implications, um, so it's pretty apparent students need to be taught racial literacy and how to examine race in relation through critical lens. Um, and educators can help students by helping them develop that vocabulary to discuss race and by utilizing social media as a teaching tool instead of shying away from it in the classroom. And lastly, um, these, I put up here some specific aspects of CRT analysis um, of college students' experience with race on social media that can actually be utilized in devising strategies for educators help students um, challenge all their perspectives on social media. Um, so for example, guiding students on identifying when public blocks is being used in posts on social media, or an attempt to deny the existence of white privilege to downplay racial inequality. So using hashtag all lives matter um, to downplay, uh, sorry, to downplay colorblind response to black and black lives matter. And then, more generally, educators can help students by valuing and validating their personal experiences with race and racism, particularly their black and minority students. And lastly, um, they can also draw attention to the way race-related incidents are portrayed in the media and provide their students with tools to critique this portrayal. So given that SMSs are being used um, not simply for social purposes, but also for political purposes, um, educators can prompt their students to take note of social media and of them, uh, and the role that they can play in empowering, and conversely, as we know, in manipulating the public, depending on who's using this media and for what end. So that's the end, I'm kind of rushed through. <laughs> But it's hard to condense uh, parts of your dissertation into a 15 minute presentation. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your uh, patience with that. All right, so. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jeremy Sawyer. I'm at, in Brooklyn at Kingsborough Community College. Um, and this is some work I did with a school psycho social psychologist named Anup Gampa. He was at University of Virginia at the time. Now he's a, a postdoc at NYU Shanghai. 
Um, and we were really inspired to do this because we both um, took part in the Black Lives Matter protests and marches in our different locations. Um, and we really felt like it was a transformative experience for us and other people who were there, and even people who just heard about it uh, and, and talked about it. So we wanted to ask the question, like, what effect might this have had on attitudes, particularly uh, implicit and explicit racial attitudes? So as, as people may know, the hashtag Black Lives Matter was created in July 2013 after George Zimmerman was acquitted in the killing of Trayvon Martin. And the movement's initiators characterized it as a response to structural anti-black racism pervading the United States and an affirmation of black folks' contributions to this society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. That's a quote from uh, founder Garza of the movement. And so Black Lives Matter really became the rallying cry of this new social movement that I think shattered our idea of a post-racial uh, society in the US and totally reoriented the national political conversation on racism. Um, and I'll, the movement has been black led, um, but also activists of multiple races, you know, marched through neighborhoods, disrupted presidential election campaign events, occupied malls, police departments, and city halls. Um, and public awareness of Black Lives Matter was very widespread. And in 2016, when this poll was taken, nearly twice as, as many Americans supported Black Lives Matter as opposed it. 43% supported, 22% opposed. So this raises the question, what impact um, might this have had on attitude, racial attitudes in the US? So just quick background on implicit attitudes people may, may know about them, but these are basically automatic emotional evaluations, positive or negative, or associations with a person or group. We know people can harbor implicit biases against groups, even if they don't explicitly or consciously endorse those positions. Um, for instance, negative associations with, with blacks might be activated, even if this contrasts with people's explicit attitudes. Um, we know implicit racial bias predicts negative interracial contact and just has been found to predict discrimination in housing, hiring, education. Uh, there was a recent meta-analysis that found implicit bias predicted biased intergroup behavior. Um, and in the well-designed studies, that correlation was like 0.37, which is a moderate correlation. Um, and we we see that in counties where whites hold greater implicit and explicit bias, we actually see worse black and white health disparities, disparities in birth weight, healthcare access, and health outcomes. This is just a picture um, from the implicit attitudes test. Um, and people may know, do people know about implicit kind of the test? All right, so I'm not gonna go into the background. <laughs> Everybody knows that. I think it's, these attitudes are pretty widespread these days and conscious about Consciousness has been raised about implicit attitudes. Um, but interestingly, we don't have much evidence that it's really possible to change these attitudes, especially with lab-based interventions. Um, we don't have much evidence that we can change people's implicit attitudes for longer than a single lab session. Um, so, and even nine effective short-term lab interventions, for example, showing people counter-stereotypical exemplars or priming multiculturalism, this all showed no lasting changes after just a few days. Um, so the authors of this study, interestingly, they concluded that, well, racial prejudice remains steadfast in the US, possibly because these bias messages are so pervasive in our society, and they saw little hope, really, for, for challenging it. Um, there's been studies on Obama, what they call the Obama effect. <laughs> um, and you know the idea was like exposure to a high status exemplar like Obama would, would shift people's racial attitudes. Um, but really, this, this study, Schmidt and Axe looked at that, and they found that actually implicit and explicit racial attitudes didn't change over the course of Obama's campaign or his presidency. So if that's not working, what hope do we have, really, for challenging these attitudes and changing these attitudes? Um, I, Anouk and I want to propose that social movements are, are a possible alternative. Um, we know the civil rights movement radically changed people's explicit attitudes about racial questions and segregation. 
And you know, Black Lives Matter asserts that blacks should, black lives, black people should be equal to those of non-blacks. And I think, you know, if we're looking for like theoretical ways that a movement might impact our consciousness, we have several things we can draw from. Um, the associative propositional evaluation model, the eighth model, suggests that um, exemplars may temporarily kind of change our implicit attitudes or activate, for instance, associations with Obama, powerful, accomplished person, um, but it doesn't seem to generalize into like a lasting change in behavior. But in contrast, I think a movement like Black Lives Matter, it's different because it connects black people and being black in general with positive images, positive discourse, that Black Lives Matter, and positive traits, because you're courageously fighting for justice, you're agentic. Um, I think it's a mass movement like this has more potential to really alter these associations on a wider society level scale. Um, you know, against these pervasive narratives of, as, of blacks as criminals, Black Lives Matter shows that blacks are targets of racism and police brutality, and they're fighting for justice. So it, it counters that narrative that we see out there. And we know from other research that hearing people voice their opinion actually humanizes them. It, and it's like, even if you disagree with the opinion you're hearing, if you hear someone voicing it, you're more likely to respect that person and humanize that person. Um, and I think that's a dynamic that happens when we see a movement like Black Lives Matter. And I think finally, there's a possibility of creating a common in-group identity for both blacks and whites, this identity of we're anti-racists, we're fighting racism. Um, and we have evidence that suggests this can reduce bias by creating a common in-group or a common purpose working together um, in a movement. Um, I think explicit attitudes can also obviously be changed by movements. Um, I think that, you know, it triggers widespread discussion in society. You may remember during Black Lives Matter, everybody was talking about racism, and that gives people a chance to consciously grapple with this and change their attitudes and shift their thinking. I think Black Lives Matter also raises hope that we can actually do something to challenge uh, racism, and it spurs uh, whites into anti-racist action, and we know that this is linked to more positive, explicit racial attitudes toward blacks. So it's working on multiple levels, the movement. Um, so what we did was we investigated the potential effects on racial attitudes with the IET race scores from Project Implicit. So we looked at 1.3 million participants um, from 2009 to 2016. And we looked at implicit and explicit attitudes before Black Lives Matter began in 2013 during Black Lives Matter, and during its highest points of struggle as well. Um, so we wanted to see both the long-term cumulative impact of the movement, but also when the movement was on the streets and most visible, and to try to see what effect that might have. Um, so we identified the seven highest Black Lives Matter struggle periods using both a history of the movement and also looking at media citations of Black Lives Matter, um, and related terms. So you can really see like these spikes in media citations around these seven historical periods when we also just know from the history the movement was very active and on the street. Um, so you can see the seven, the seven um, periods here, the acquittal of Zimmerman, the uprising in Ferguson when Michael Brown was killed, the non-indictments of police uh, who killed Michael Brown and Eric Garner, um, protests of Freddie Gray's death, um, the mass shooting at the Black Church in Charleston and the subsequent protests that removed the Confederate flag, people may remember, from uh, the South Carolina Capitol. And also the Black Lives Matter disruptions of presidential election events uh, and the subsequently forcing the Democratic National Committee to pass a resolution on Black Lives Matter. Um, and finally the response to the shooting of Black Lives Matter activists in Minnesota. This is a picture of Ferguson. All right, so what were the results? So after we controlled, statistically controlled for any shifts in participants um, across Black Lives Matter or from pre-Black Lives Matter to Black Lives Matter, um, we found that 
implicit attitudes were in, uh, significantly less pro-white during Black Lives Matter than before Black Lives Matter. We saw attitudes become less pro-white across the duration of Black Lives Matter. And during most periods, I believe it was five out of seven periods of high struggle, um, people's attitudes were less pro-white compared to the previous 30 days. Um, in terms of explicit racial attitudes, um, oh, and I should say these changes the, were mostly among white people um, because black participants were already pretty close to no preference, no bias. Um, so really these changes are in white people. Um, explicit attitudes, white, whites became less explicitly pro-white. Interestingly, blacks also became less explicitly pro-black in terms of um, explicit attitudes. So each group moved toward what you could call an egalitarian no preference position in terms of explicit attitudes. This is a regression discontinuity analysis of pre-Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter begins here, and these are the high points of struggle. Um, so you can see not only was the mean pro-white bias lower in Black Lives Matter, but it had a downward trajectory over time, which maybe indicates a cumulative effect to suggest that about Black Lives Matter. And if you zoom in on this, you would see like drops in pro-white bias among these seven, um, seven high points of Black Lives Matter struggle. So one question that was raised for us though was, was there a backlash uh, among conservatives to Black Lives Matter, especially given the existence of these counter movements like All Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter, which were alluded to here. Um, and we actually found, so we split it out by political orientation, we actually found that the reductions in pro-white or anti-black bias occurred across the political spectrum. Um, however, among liberals, uh, the effect size was larger among liberals. The change was bigger among liberals than among conservatives, but it did have an effect across the political spectrum. So what can we gather from this? It seems like there's kind of you know, converging evidence from these multiple different levels of analysis that suggests that pro-white bias decreased during Black Lives Matter. Um, as far as we know, this is the first evidence that directly connects a social movement with societal level changes in implicit and explicit attitudes. Um, although the effect sizes are pretty small, the Cohen's D is around 0.1, um, I think you know, such like these, this level of effects across many individuals can represent shifts in attitudes which impact discrimination that's meaningful. Greenwald has done some work on this. Um, so although we'd like these effects, I think, to be larger, um, it indicates something's going on, something's moving maybe uh, in response to this movement. Um, one question is, you know, if we think the civil rights movement, did it have a bigger impact on attitudes? And I'm not sure, because I don't know if that study's been done. But if we feel like the civil rights movement maybe made a bigger change in explicit attitudes, what is this related to? Could this be related to the fact that the civil rights movement actually won structural changes in society, it won sweeps, like sweeping legal reforms, it ended segregation, um, whereas Black Lives Matter has maybe not yet won such tangible reforms uh, as the civil rights movement did in the past. So does that impact the size of the attitude change? I think that's an open and an interesting question. Um, so future directions, we hope that, you know, that people will see that anti-racist social movements are an alternative to these lab-based interventions uh, where we're trying to change people's attitudes for brief durations. Um, and it raises the question, I think, does this, gener does this generalize to other biases? For instance, anti-LGBT bias um, and the social movements who are fighting those biases, the LGBT rights movement, um, are we seeing similar responses to movements um, changing attitudes on these other fronts? Um, and I think you know, social movements may change attitudes through both conscious and associational automatic implicit level mechanisms, um, and perhaps by redefining our group identity. Um, and enhancing our efficacy, I think, is important to collectively resist racism. It gives us a sense we can do something, and that's inspiring and that can promote change. Um, if you want to read more about the full story about this, um, you can check out this article in uh, Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin that I did. Thank you, guys.
questions for everybody. Yeah, so there's one more person on the schedule. I don't know if Isaiah is here. Um, okay, if not, then questions for Jeremy, questions for any of us. Yeah, that's a great question, and I would love to yeah do some work on a follow up like study around that. We were there was a great um, I think there was a bulletin put out called Beyond the hashtags. Yeah. Um, yeah, you may have seen that, which really I think it reports all that Twitter data like by location and zip code and so forth. So we were kind of thinking like, oh, that's the next step to really <laughs> dig into that, and we were like, it's too much to do right now. But <laughs> that yeah, I think that would be a great next step to really localize or pinpoint where the where it was biggest on the streets. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, I had a question about a more peripheral finding. So you found that for blacks their explicit attitudes became less pro black. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sense of that? That's a great question. Yeah. I, I I'm not completely sure of myself. Um, well just to yeah to I can say this. Um, implicit attitudes for blacks were very close to the zero point which I mentioned to the no bias point. When you look at explicit racial attitudes, um, each group sort of diverges around zero. So whites are kind of pro-white explicitly to some degree. Blacks are pro-black. Um, I don't know. I see that more as like, um, you know, when you're when you're subject to racism and oppression, I feel like there's value in sort of saying, no, I'm proud to be black, or I'm proud to be this, and sort of claiming that identity and having pride. I think that's what we see in pride movements of various types um, in activism. So I sort of see it as a protective factor, or that's what I'm thinking, you know, for um, black people to have an explicitly pro-black attitude is like a protective factor against racism. But it's interesting that when the movement arose, both groups sort of moved toward no preference. So I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts on that. I think it's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Um, one of your statistics that I, or one of the um, studies that you mentioned talked about uh, low, low um, uh, mortality birth, uh, birth rates. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking like, you know, how, how could your work um, be used as, as an application for medical schools, for example, because you see a lot of biases happening in medical schools. And although we don't have any way to reduce implicit bias in a lab setting, how can we use something as a you know a social change or a social movement? And 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 how can we use that information to to put it in curriculums and so we can see a reduction of implicit biases happening in not only medical schools but like healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the hope is like a movement like Black Lives Matter, and hopefully there will be future movements like this, would really have a ripple effect to all sectors of society, including healthcare and education and hiring and housing. Hopefully it would have a positive ripple effect in decreasing bias in all those sectors. But maybe if a movement particularly arose, specifically mm -hmm. around health demands or specifically around housing, Maybe it would have more of a direct targeted impact to that, to bias in that area, which would be interesting. Yeah, and just to follow up, just very quick, sorry. Um, what is your um, perspective of you know requiring the IAT test in curriculums? Do you think that could have a positive change um, for medical providers and how to healthcare professionals in order to improve services or any other? you know, aspect of life, you know, I mean, requiring the IAT and, and testing. Yeah, that's a good question. I can't, I don't really feel like I have a good opinion on that right now. Like, mm -hmm. is it a good educational tool to like raise awareness of implicit biases? I feel like there's potential um, for that. Um, although when you start requiring and mandating things, sometimes that can invite backlash and other things. So yeah, I think that's an interesting question to explore. And maybe others just have thoughts on that as well. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a sort of general question for the panel. Um, I think that like it, it feels like often 
So I, I'm familiar with a fair bit of research that suggests that in fact those that negative emotion aspect is really important. But like you say, it's really important to have the like the infrastructure in place to handle that emotion. So for my talk, I'm interested in like these less formal settings with people who are less equipped to manage that. It's probably advantageous to recommend things that are the less likely to induce backlash. But certainly in more formal settings and whenever possible, uh, it's crucial to have an avenue for dealing with whatever feelings are brought up. Yeah, I'll respond to that too. So based on um, the research I conducted with uh, college students, um, a lot of them talked about how um, you know they did feel these obviously very strong emotions talking about race and racism. Uh, and what was really important is to not only have um, discussions in the classroom that kind of accompanied uh, what they were seeing online, but also to have them facilitated by an instructor who was very well informed and able to, you know, um, you know, maybe like address um, these emotional issues, um, and also to just help them uh, think critically uh, through everything instead of just. Uh, you know, responding emotionally and then kind of um, shutting down, which can happen, um, right? So they talked about how that was very important to have it facilitated and mediated um, by somebody who was well informed and able to do that, had experience. So if I could just follow up on that really quick, like, you get a little bit more specific on, like, what sort of strategies or things that you might have found in this book? That's a really good question. I don't know if there's anyone else that so I'll think about it. I mean, so I mean, what I was presenting on wasn't really designed to identify specific things, but um, I, yeah, I mean, for the context that I was focusing on, I think that there are uh, resources you can think of that are widely accessible that have characteristics that are less likely to induce backlash and or contain like information about what to do with the feelings that you, that you have. Um, I mean, I think I mean, part of the reason I brought this up was because I think we can do better at for creating those kinds of resources and making them available, um, at least for those circumstances where there's little expert oversight or formal structure involved. Yeah, and I would just hope that yeah, educational materials would um, include information about movements, you know, the history of civil rights movement, black power movement, Black Lives Matter, because I feel like there's something really transformative about especially learning about social movements and the way racism has changed and fought um, historically. Yeah, and um, just to add on to that, um, I think it's important to uh, have students realize, or anybody realize that we all play a part in uh, the system and we're all involved with systemic racism, so it's not just targeting you know, white people. Um, we all play a role. Like in the, that quotation, I think I read it to you guys, of the South Asian student, um, who said, you know, uh, she was a supporter of using the hashtag All Lives Matter um, and didn't, you know, understand that it could be seen as colorblind or that, you know, so we are all invested in the system. We all um, are impacted by systemic racism and to maybe like frame any conversations um, like that about, you know, that way instead of, um, you know, just targeting um, the whites or white people in general, be like, <laughs> this is just for a problem to solve. And I think Black Lives Matter is really powerful. In the statements of the founders, you see that they're, yeah, they're not just like targeting white people, but it's like they're targeting the structural racism in society that comes out in all these different institutions, the police, housing, and so forth. So I think they really take a systemic view of racism, and I think that's a helpful political approach to challenge. Any other questions? I was just going to throw it open if, if other people have thoughts. Uh, actually, people pose really good questions like about the dynamic of explicit attitudes, how that changed. I don't know if other people have thoughts on that, or um, I don't have an answer, but maybe other people do have thoughts on that.
interesting to look at it generationally and see that there's different dynamics going on. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, like keep, everybody. I would love to keep talking about this. I'm yeah. sure my co-panelists would like to as well. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, thank you so much for being here. <laughs>